Uh, today's session is going to talk um, and address ecosystem based adaptation, standards, criteria, and linkages, which is a bit abstract. Of course, two terms, standards and criteria, are not self explicit, but uh, also the linkages to other ecosystem based approaches uh, that are out there now being promoted by different uh, groups, by different agencies, such as ecosystem based performance reduction, such as nature based solutions. And we want also to start discussing how this concept might uh, interlink a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure to have uh, uh, with us here a, a great uh, uh, panel. Um, and um, now we just have a switching slide. Um, so um, we're going to start with a keynote uh, from um, uh, Ali Raza uh, Rizvi, who is a program manager uh, on ecosystem-based adaptation uh, at IUCN. Uh, he will have uh, 15 minutes, and actually he's going to share this talk a little bit uh, uh, with uh, Kat Blackwood also, who is going to talk about this poster that is behind me. Um, we're then uh, going to move to uh, Angela Andre, who is uh, the CEM uh, Chair and uh, Global uh, Policy Di Director at Conservation uh, International. We will talk to us a little bit about uh, principles uh, in, in EBA. Uh, we will follow with uh, um, um, uh, Mike Beck, who is a lead marine scientist at uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, and also a joint uh, professor at the University of uh, California in Santa Cruz. Um, we will then uh, move to uh, Alan Nichol, who is strategic program leader, uh, promoting sustainable growth at the International Water Management uh, Institute. Uh, we will then hear from uh, Natalie Seven, who is a professor of biodiversity at Oxford University, and also a research associate at IIED. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Margarita Cancel, who is a general coordinator of adaptation to climate change of the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change uh, in the government. Uh, of Mexico. And uh, we will follow this order. Uh, at the end of each uh, presentation, I will ask you for clarification questions if you have, but really clarification questions because then the discussion will be taken up as a panel uh, discussion, and here you can interact with our panelists uh, more generally uh, on, on the issue. Ali uh, has to leave after his presentation, so he will stay until the clarification questions, and then Kat will come and sit here in his place to. Uh, uh, participate as a panelist uh, to answer also uh, the IUCN side of things. The session has two broad uh, uh, guiding questions, which will be addressed either in the presentation or in the discussion. Uh, and you can uh, keep us to task here to also make sure that we do address these questions when we have the discussion. So the first one is on uh, existing principles, guidelines, and standards related to specific ecosystem-based approaches. Of course, the focus here is on EBA, but if some of you are champions of EcoDRR or nature-based solutions, you may want also to, to, to have a discussion uh, around this and to see where there are gaps and how we can address them and which ones are to be addressed with priority. The second question is, can there be a convergence between all these ecosystem-based approaches uh, that we are going to be discussing about? A more fundamental question, perhaps, is it needed? Do we really need to try to have this convergence? Uh, or not, if not, then how do we differentiate between them? Is there a hierarchy uh, between them? Or, and is this important? So these are the two general guiding questions for um, uh, the session. I just want to mention that the session is being recorded. The panelists uh, have been informed and none have had objections, but your questions, comments will also be recorded. So if you have a problem with that, don't ask questions, I guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, it will then be made available more, more uh, broadly. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Fabrice Renault. I'm with the United Nations University for Environment and Human Security here in Vaughan, and I will be moderating uh, this session. So without any further ado, I would like to um, ask um, <coughs> Ali for the, the keynote presentation.
and I will ask the panelists, you can move your chairs on the sides like we did yesterday because it's full here, so, so you can see the presentation also, if you wish. We can do the chairs here like this. Sorry about that, but it's a full room. So. Good afternoon. Uh, are you seeing point this term ecosystem based adaptation and the conservationists and you know actors we all got together you know perhaps we didn't have the idea that where we are stepping into because ecosystem based adaptation it's human centered conservation organizations most of them you know it's more biodiversity environment centered so that's the premise I will be sharing with you based on that, what is going on. And yesterday you learned a lot about ecosystem-based adaptation, its potential, what you know, we can achieve in the world and all this can perhaps change the world, address all the climate associated issues along with local economies and all that. But I will be sharing with you what's going wrong because of the time constraint, just 12 minutes and other you know what's happening on ground with all the journey we have done and all this but there are still challenges which we need to be cognizant of and then resolve because to resolve any issue first thing is to appreciate that there is a problem we have achieved we have at the policy level we have a lot of funding going on but there are few things which we need to be very cognizant of before going there, let me share that all this information is coming based on a lot of experience. Since 2010, rather 9, IUCN has 57 projects in 67 countries which has ecosystem-based adaptation component. And in those, we are working with local communities, members, partners, so they are all over the world. And you can see they have different areas where we are working in different regions. They have different thematic focus from disaster risk reduction to securing livelihoods, gender element, policy influence and all this. So this is how we are working and going all about it to how best we can address climate related uh, uh, challenges along with safeguarding the integrity of local ecosystems and biodiversity. But first thing is, EBA is not business as usual. What's happening many a time, because EBA got attention with the donors, we were doing the same thing and we just changed the name. By we, I mean the conservation sector. We were doing biodiversity, <coughs> conservation and other, we said, no, there will be co-benefits to humans, let's call it ecosystem-based adaptation. That's the fine line which differentiated from climate smart conservation and ecosystem based adaptation. Climate smart conservation is to integrate climate risk into conservation and biodiversity, but the objective remains to safeguard the integrity of ecosystems. Co-benefits may or may not help local humans, but in ecosystem based adaptation, center point is human well-being. If you look at the definition, it is the use of uh, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services to enhance climate resilience of humans while you know, safeguarding integrity of local ecosystem. So that's critical. 80 to 90 percent sometimes we are doing business as usual, calling it ecosystem based adaptation. So it's very critical that we need to see what we are trying to do. And again, at the same time, not let maladaptation, ruining local ecosystems and biodiversity. So trades off are critical. When we do anything and everything has an impact, you know, we cannot say, oh, you know, this what we are doing would be win-win for everyone. If you want to have a cup of tea, it has its own impact from where the sugar is coming, from where the milk is coming, from where the plastic in which it's wrapped is coming. So everything has an impact. So when we try to sell biodiversity conservation, we give these examples. But when we do EPA, many a time we say, oh, it's win-win, everything will be rosy once you implement it. No, there are issues which we need to appreciate 
and then resolve. Otherwise, we are destroying in local ecosystems and then local economies which are based on local natural resources. Many a time we have done work all over the world, our members, partner, and all, you know, like for example, availability of say fresh water. And fresh water, local communities really love you. Oh, yeah, we had to walk 10 miles to get it. Now we have available at our doorsteps. Gender mark, tick mark, women don't have to go far. Youth participation, everything. Third party evaluation comes in. They are very happy. Oh, yeah, community is saying it's a wonderful project. And what? Downstream, have we ever done environmental impact <coughs> assessment of our initiatives? No, we teach others. They do it for everything any physical development, we are extracting maybe hundreds and thousands of gallons of water to make it available for local communities. So the project beneficiaries are getting a lot of benefit. What about freshwater biodiversity? What about downstream water? So we cannot see when, you know, okay, what is happening because we don't have MNEs which are beyond projects. Our MNE systems, many a time, donors evaluations, those just restrict ourselves on project. So we do a little bit of here and there and just say, oh, this is really good and we can have it. And most of the projects, they are unintentionally doing it. And so we have to look into that and have to do due diligence of all interventions which are field-based. So due diligence, you must be aware, you know, the private sector, whenever you do, we look into okay, what could be the impact in the long run. <coughs> and then tools and guidance, we love tools. Uh, you know, WCMC did wonderful work and compiled all inventory of, you know, through a project, 223 pro uh, tools directly related to EBA. So we know that there are tools, it's not, the tools are not there, but we produce tools and then we leave them with them through a workshop or something, okay, use it. Many a time community people, they come back to us and then say, okay, do we need to hire a consultant to decipher what's written in there in these techniques and tools? So it's critical that whatever we do, we see how those will be used, how best we can take them forward and those bring in those, those are value added, otherwise, you know, maybe another consultant, we are creating jobs for others, okay, okay, help them out, local communities, many a tools, trust me, I'm in this sector 22 years, I can't decipher them after two, three introductory pages, how best to do, maybe I'm not qualified, but definitely the community's practitioners, they don't have time to go through these. So that's another thing about tools and all these, those are critical very important, no doubt about it. But let's see who is our target audience to do that. And then again, let's not think by having, you know, just, uh, you know, prepare a community to have drought management or something and we are enhancing climate resilience, sustainable climate resilience is an oxymoron. You cannot achieve it. It's a moving target. Climate is changing. <coughs> so should be our solutions. But sometimes we have a solution, we seek problems to apply those. Okay, where can we use it? No, it should come with local, whatever things are going on at the local community level, what are their issues? We, through a project-oriented approach, we cannot address everything. So we should, when we prioritize, let's also help and empower communities so that they can respond to changing environment and climate. So if you prepare them for drought management, maybe after three years, same area will be hit by flooding. So that's the what it's the most complex project, climate change. And at times, perhaps we are not even appreciating it because we look into our own silos. We think, okay, by having ecosystem healthy, everything resolved. No, governance, poverty, other things. So this is one of the best approaches, but sometimes it's not being implemented properly. And then again, when we talk about standards, we talk about donors, you know, having all these, many a time we just, you know, apply them to have a tick mark exercise. Everything is done. Yes, gender is there. We sprinkle gender in our reports, in our re progress, in our planning processes. It's done. Are we really doing it? 
are we creating just ownership or is it real participation or decision making by local communities and other things. So that's another problem we should be very careful about. And the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Ecosystem-based adaptation, are we valued, really valued? <laughs> the reason, you know, what is the cost-benefit analysis? Are we really, you know, still trying to sell it and all this after 10 years and all that? So, we need to come up with evidence. Okay, not just anecdotal, oh, it happened in my project area, five women got so empowered, they got into university and have you know, children are going to school and all this. What is the scale of it? How to scale it up? How, who is our target audience? Does the environment ministries, environment and other, with all the due respect, in developing countries, they don't have resources. Are we really have planning commissions, finance ministry, commerce? Are we able to sell it to them? Sadly, no. It's very best, it's the requirement we are having maybe over 200 EPA projects all over the world, all of our organizations, but they are getting funding from the donors. Taxpayers money from Germany going into that, other countries in going into that. How much public investment is coming into EPA? We need to see and that will show us what value we have. And in some countries it started, so we need to have those strategies where we link broader implementation project into local investment planning. Otherwise, we will keep questioning okay, how things are and in the end will go. Another important is that adaptation is not a goal. When we start having it as a goal, that ecosystem-based adaptation and all these goals, it's a means. It's a means towards overall local sustainable development. <coughs> You know, many a time I hear wonderful presentation at co-op and everywhere. Oh, we are at the forefront of adaptation. We have done so much, learn from us. Yes. What is good adaptation? To date, are there any yardstick when we say it's a good adaptation? What standards? What is out there when we say, oh, it's a wonderful, great project? Is the implementation of work plan a great imp adaptation or is it just the impl effective implementation of a project and then churning out activity after activity going to the next project sometimes I think we have been pushing to hunger again survive by having new projects and all this so nobody <coughs> is looking into impact assessment and we think okay we have done activities and that adaptation has been achieved no it's a means unless and until we will address poverty reduction and conservation together and social, ecological and that is what is sustainable development you all know. So we cannot do EBA in isolation and we cannot just say okay, this is good or that is bad because that's not adaptation. Thank you very much. Michael. for this uh, reality check also, I think, when uh, we talk about the ecosystem based adaptation. You have to remember that he has a program on EBA, okay, so uh, he knows what he's talking about in terms of the implementation and the impacts of uh, this project. And now, Kat, do you want to present a, a yeah, poster? Has questions for yeah. Yeah. You won't be able to read, but at least do no. the principles. Uh, <laughs> this is about okay, why do we need to have standards? Because all these issues and you know, adaptation sector does not have adaptation. 20, 25 years of we still struggling and adaptation indicators mostly are project indicators. So it's an attempt where you know nothing is perfect in the world. So we started <coughs> somewhere together with GIZ, IAED, WCMC, and other members and FIBA partners to come up with some sort of st start so that we can move towards not having straight jacket, not policing, but having some standards so that we can say this is what needs to be done and improved. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, I'll just walk you through briefly what this paper and this assessment framework is. 
and, um, and why we made it. So it's a collaboration underneath the Friends of EBA Network, which IUCN coordinates. And this paper in particular was authored by colleagues at GIZ, Ali and myself and other IUCN colleagues, as well as some from IIED. Um, and it was endorsed by over a dozen Friends of EBA as well. So it has great um, support from the EBA community. So we designed this framework because we want policymakers and practitioners to ag agree on what qualifies as EBA. We have the CBD definition from 2009, but we wanted to sort of um, blow that up a bit and, and dig in deeper. Uh, so this paper defines three elements based on that CBD definition. Uh, one, it helps people adapt. Two, it makes active use of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And three, it's not standalone. It's part of a bigger policy picture, a bigger adaptation picture. Um, next, we thought about um, a bit more finely about qualification criteria. So underneath that first element of EBA, um, it reduces social and environmental vulnerabilities. Um, so it brings everyone up to hopefully even footing. And second, it will generate societal benefits in the context of climate change adaptation. It's very much about people. Um, underneath the second element about using ecosystem services and biodiversity, um, we want to look at ecosystem health. We want to at least maintain it or hopefully restore or improve it. And last, um, we don't want countries to, um, to create an EBA policy. We want EBA to be part of multiple sectors policies at multiple <coughs> levels, from the community uh, to the national level and international levels. Um, so the two criteria under that element are, of course, that EBA is supported by policies at multiple levels, and um, it supports, e it in turn, supports equitable governance and enhances capacities. So a little bit of a two-way um, spread there. So what you can see here is sort of a slice of um, this larger table that defines 20 quality standards. Um, so when we talk about quality, and it's qualitative, <laughs> Um, we've designed this sort of continuum of EBA quality, which we would um, sort of assess based on the use of some indicators, which we've suggested, whether, um, whether an EBA measure or intervention um, can, be, can be judged to um, be strong or weak. And I was at an event on Monday where it was pointed out to me that Calling an EBA measure weak might not be constructive. So um, something that we've maybe thought about doing is saying room for improvements. You know, <laughs> do it better next time. And the example we have at the top here, which is I think a pretty important one, is the use of climate information. So this is helping people adapt, and it's adapting to climate change. So if we don't, a question that I would pose to you and, and to the panel as well is, if we don't use climate information, if we don't do vulnerability assessments, can we call something EBA? Um, and that's a very complicated question. Um, and again, it goes through this entire list of 20 quality standards. And you can get the paper if you're interested by scanning this QR code or going to abucn.org slash FIBA. You can download it there. And we really we would like your feedback. We're pilot testing this in a, a project that Ali and I are working on with the Mountain Institute in um, several mountainous countries around the world and, and other initiatives as well. Anything to add? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any yeah. Yeah. clarification questions for both Ali and Kat? Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate. It has to be participatory. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One here and then um, yeah, thank you. You said you're pilot testing it. Um, are you going to apply the standard, analyze many different projects based on these standards, and then kind of a follow up? Is there a way of kind of validating these standards that you have, the criteria? Uh, what we are doing during the inception phase, we are using it to guide our planning process and, you know, defining intervention. Because, you know, what was happening again, not naming names, but one organization just providing chicken and calling it EBA and at an extreme another one 
doing you know involving fishermen in Thailand to open massage parlor trust me it's I'm serious and they calling it an EB activity okay you know it's alternate sources of income for fishermen so you know again it could be right for the local condition it could be local or this but can it help us to define something so that because right now we are coming up with apple and oranges so we can't have comparative advantage whether it's working or not so at the planning level at the implementation level m &E level and then also impact assessment we intend to use it so pilot testing we are right now using it for our planning purpose but we also will do a continuous evaluation of intervention <coughs> and impact and I'm not saying it's easy, it's very difficult because we cannot see another, what are the attributional factors of the project intervention, what other things are going on. If there is poverty and not access to human rights, whatever you do, people will remain the same and most vulnerable. Cynthia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's also related to this planning uh, uh, level of testing. Uh, have you tested in, uh, in cities? No. Right now, most of the funding which is going in EBA, that's rural focused. Because we are all, most of us, I would say not all, most of us are donor dependent. So many a time we tailor our things as per the opportunities. So that's how it's mostly rural focused. But yes, uh, it can also be adopted and adapted in the urban setting. We're just setting up a urban uh, working group at FIBA and they would start looking into that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. I'm so sorry I wanted to be with you and you know share more information and learn from you and your all questions. Over the last four or five days, really intelligent questions were coming up, but I have to go somewhere else. <coughs> so sorry for that, but maybe next time or our emails are available. And if you want to contact us, and we will be in touch with German Development Center. And thank you for organizing all this. And we will be working for some research work with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to uh, Angela Andra. <coughs> Thank you, Fabrice, for the invitation to this um, event. I want, uh, well, I think that the right way to address the issue of EBA is first recognizing that the, this work started almost 10 years ago when a group of international organizations under the leadership of IUCN um, convened um, a document on uh, for the um, uh, COP in Poznan, and the idea was to introduce the issue of uh, adaptation in a very stronger way under the shared vision. These items were discussed in, in that COP. Uh, the important to, to remind that in those days, uh, the main focus of the Climate Change Convention was on mitigation. Adaptation was something very minor, and uh, the, the point is that uh, people didn't realize really the importance of uh, adaptation and the importance of climate change in those days. So when the, the whole story of uh, EBA started in, in that moment, the CBD immediately <coughs> developed a very important document, and it was an ad hoc uh, workshop on ecosystem-based approaches to adaptation and mitigation. And uh, it's important also to keep in mind that uh, ecosystem-based adaptation uh, principles are directly related to the ecosystem approach that it was adopted by the CBD in the year 2000. But as you know, all the conventions are working separately, so it was really difficult for many people under the Climate Change Convention to accept that it was an issue about uh, uh, the land, the oceans where we live, and that the, the role of ecosystem services was the key point of the whole definition and that it's um, um, oriented to human well-being and to local people and to people in general. It's not about ecosystems. The ecosystems, uh, they will survive without us. We are the ones who need ecosystems 
to continue our lives. So after that, a group of organizations under the leadership of IUCN, uh, we developed a set of principles that were adopted uh, by these organizations in the year um, 2012. And I will uh, make some reference to those, some of those principles because in our view, part of the failures or that were explained by Ali is because these principles have not been um, adopted properly. So, uh, well, we all know that, uh, well, the relevance of uh, adaptation in general, but we need to do it in a different context. We need to know that it's a process and uh, the, e the concept of EVA is also an evolving concept. No, and um, we always, uh, whenever we apply the ecosystem-based adaptation concept, we have to know that the information and the, uh, the reference on climate change is, is also evolving. Some years later, the IPCC, for example, developed um, a new document in 2012 highlighting the role of uh, extreme weather events, especially for some uh, countries where um, El Nino or other extreme weather events were really affecting the um, and, and creating more impact to the ecosystems. No? So, and most of the actions should be developed to address this um, this type of events. Um, so, another important point is also well, Ali already mentioned that is regarding the role of people. So we know the definition of EVA, I'm not going to repeat that. Nowadays, in the literature, we, we, we have seen a lot of new um, uh, possibilities that are also related to uh, EVA, that are natural climate solutions, so more related to agroecosystems, urban ecosystems, and the interaction between ecosystems, and I, I will talk about that later. So the principles of the of the of EBA, and this is part of it of the main questions that we had for this session, it's about uh, well what principles have been developed. So I will mention, for example, the first one that is about promotion of resilience of societies and ecosystems. So one important point is that we we don't have still enough information about the process underpinning ecosystem services and there is a lack of data on, on that component. In, in most cases, the EBA projects are dealing with the, the main ecosystem services which are water provision. So in, in several projects in which we have been involved, we are focusing on some, but they, we really need to, inter, to include other ecosystem services and we know that it's not practical and not easy to address complex systems. But this is an important point. Uh, regarding, for example, the whole biodiversity component, in many cases, what we, uh, the information we have is more related to species, not really to ecosystem process. And the, the CBD convention deals with um, biodiversity at different level. And for example, regarding ecosystems, IUCN is already is, has been working for the last years, developing a new. Um, a, a new tool that I think is combined with, could be combined with uh, with this that is the red list of ecosystem assessments. We have been implementing that in several countries, and I think that this um, tool provides information about ecosystem integrity. That is the key point, and it, it has been already adopted by the uh, Paris Agreement. So I think that this is one important point. Um, regarding the second one, well, we are still lacking of collaboration between uh, sectors, but especially beneficiaries of ecosystem services. So whenever, for example, we are dealing with water, we have competition between different sectors. <coughs> so we have to, to see the water facilities that are providing water for human populations in cities, for example, versus the use of water for agriculture and other land uses. and due to the changes in water provision that is one of the main consequences of climate change impacts, for example, in, in high mountains, uh, this is a key point. Um, it's also important to notice that the, the difficulties in working across sectorial interests. For me, that is a very important point because at the end, uh, this discussion is, the, is, uh, is taking place at the local level or uh, and it's really conflicting the, the use of many ecosystem services. In regard to 
And number three, I think that nowadays the point is not just going to the lowest level of um, of um, uh, the lowest uh, yeah, level, social level or governance level, but it's more about relationships between ecosystems at landscape level. So it was mentioned the role of urban areas, but in my view it's even more important the linkages between urban areas and the hinterland because the, we are uh, developing very vulnerable ecosystems that are cities and they depend on the ecosystem services provided by the hinterland and there we are really um, creating um, ecosystems that are at risk. Uh, in regard to number four, I think, well, the centralized management at, at the lowest level, it's, uh, it's difficult because in many cases the lowest level that we have are the municipalities. And in, in, our, in most of the countries, Latin American countries, the municipalities are quite, quite big. No, so we really need to go and to build uh, from the lower level and develop governance levels that are really acceptable and that they involve all the actors and, and key stakeholders in the whole process. Regarding number five, one of the main um, concerns is uh, the prevalence of short-term thinking in planning and uh, we mentioned that we are product oriented in most of the cases. Unfortunately, the, that's the way in which EBA has been uh, developed. These principles, as I mentioned, were developed for projects, but also for policy making. So in this one, the, we, we really need to, to have to go beyond projects and develop um, initiatives that are uh, long term. Regarding uh, number six, well, I think that we still need a lot to, to do on establishing um, networks to ensure that the information is really uh, mainstream, that is really used by the key stakeholders. Uh, because as we know, uh, EBA, in, and it has been mentioned, is about people. And uh, that means uh, and people have interests, people have lived in uh, different places, but people are the only ones in our territories who decide what to do and what not to do. We cannot impose things, we can develop incentives, we can propose things, but at the very end they are the ones who are, should be empowered to take their own decisions. So this is why um, um, principle number seven is so important. And uh, one of the limitations as well is the cultural component because there are different views of the same resources by different people. So when this is happening, uh, there is a lot of conflict uh, uh, between sectors and, and even well between the, the local populations. So some of the of the main uh, barriers that uh, I, I already mentioned, uh, they are also related to possibilities and guidance for the future. Now some of these barriers are not just related to EBA but in, with other ecosystem-based approaches. <coughs> and for important points for guidance is to prove the evidence base from social and ecological systems. We are the, the, the criteria for monitoring in many cases have to be updated. It's not the same way we are using, <coughs> we are used to take information about hydrology or about socioeconomic components. It has to be adapted to these specific purposes. Um, we need to, to enable adaptive management. This is a key point of the whole process. Promote collaboration across sectors and uh, encourage changes in attitudes from individuals to communities. This is quite extremely important because we don't realize the, um, the importance of culture in the whole process. Improve the communication strategy. Ensure that the that, um, the quality level and, and the certainty of the information that is used. Uh, take note of all the unintended results. Uh, for example, well, recently uh, Ali presented some important points, uh, but we have to learn from those experiences, no? And see in which cases these experiences in the long term are really uh, creating maladaptation. And one final recommendation is that we need to go from project-oriented to process-oriented actions. 
regarding our work in IUCN, uh, we are um, working on the, um, as it was said, on the development of standards and criteria. The group of EBA had already developed some proposals and they have been adopted by others. Now we are in the process of linking other um, standards and criteria that Fabrice mentioned on ECODRR, for example, on ecosystem resilience. Mike was here yesterday and he is leading that uh, process. And a, a big challenge is also a, a linking ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation because these are two um, aspects that have to be better um, uh, linked. So a new work that we are developing at the moment is to use these basic uh, principles and standards that are already uh, in place and develop some specific standards and criteria for nature solutions. So you have any, any question or you have my email? And very much Angela for this principle but also for uh, opening to the other ecosystem based approaches that uh, we can discuss. Uh, I can just take one very quick clarification question if there is any. No? Okay great. So we will now move to uh, uh, Mike. Uh, you want to come here? You want me to flip the slides? Uh, yeah if you could just uh, change from there I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give from here. Uh, so. Uh, Good, good afternoon, good morning still. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to have one simple message today. Um, if you want our standards, indicators, and tools picked up by other sectors, then you better design them with them in mind. In fact, you ought to use their tools, indicators, and measures in the first place whenever possible. Um, Anyone who knows the Nature Conservancy knows that we're very good at developing our own tools. Um, but really, we had a big sea change in the work that we did when we sort of stopped using ecosystem service tools that we were developing and started looking at what the engineering and insurance sector were doing and started using their tools because it was their pickup that we really wanted. Um, we were mostly focused on the role of natural habitats as coastal defenses, uh, and so those were obvious sectors uh, of, of high importance to us. I've shown in, in this slide uh, a couple of examples uh, of that. So if you look at the uh, upper rightmost slide, uh, this is work that we did supported by Lloyds of London, uh, done with uh, Guy Carpenter, they're an insurance brokerage firm, uh, and RMS, uh, Risk Management Solutions. They're a, uh, one of the two leading modeling firms for the entire risk industry. We used their models and their proprietary databases to ask what was the role of coastal wetlands during Hurricane Sandy? How important were they? How much property damage did they reduce? The slide there summarizes that. Areas in, in deeper red um, uh, were reductions in damages by as much as 20% or more in those areas. Uh, so areas with marshes reducing damages really significantly and we showed it using their models, their tools. We published in the first instance that report uh, a year ago. It was picked up immediately, uh, put up in uh, White House policy briefs on uh, financing community resilience. Uh, and then used by many in the, in the industry. Um, uh, on the White House side, uh, uh, alas, you, you, you might have heard that we had a change of administration. <laughs> um, but we've also uh, been uh, working uh, with others on cost-benefit analysis. So uh, in the lower left uh, is an example where uh, we were examining uh, the cost-effectiveness of nature-based solutions relative to gray infrastructure solutions. <laughs> Uh, in this case, we use tools developed by Swiss Re and McKinsey uh, across the entire Gulf of Mexico uh, to show that oyster reefs and marshes were among the most cost-effective uh, nature-based measures for risk reduction and adaptation. Uh, if you can go to, to the next slide. Uh, a lot of this work uh, we first started de developing with the World Bank and we said, how do we go about measuring uh, these benefits? And this one slide encapsulates a 170-page report that we did on the, the role of mangroves and reefs. 
uh, in building coastal resilience. Uh, and it basically takes and adapts the methods uh, from the engineering and insurance community to the application of understanding the value and benefits of reefs and mangroves. Um, this is actually, this summarizes a very complex set of hydrodynamic and economic models, but in general you need to know something about wave conditions on the left. Um, uh, you bring those waves and water levels over uh, the habitats, and then you do that across the entire storm frequency distribution. That is your 1 in 10 year storm, your 1 in 25 year, your 1 in 50 year storm. Um, you do that first with those habitats in place and you get that uh, first solid uh, pink line which is uh, the flooding level with a 1 in 10 year, uh, for say a 1 in 10 year storm with those habitats in place. You then remove the habitat in some way, shape or form. With coral reefs, uh, we remove just the topmost meter of the reef. Uh, with mangroves, uh, we remove all of the mangroves and we ask, what would the new flooding line look like? And that's the dash line on the far right uh, in this example. All of the people and property between those lines are the people and property benefiting from keeping those habitats in place. You can turn this around, you can also look at it as restoration or adaptation. What's the increases in benefits from those kinds of measures? Uh, last slide please, Fabrice. Um, uh, and we've applied those methods for both coral reefs and mangroves globally, and we've put these values in the context that can be used, for example, in national accounting. So we've provided these as annual expected benefits for mangroves, in this case, from flood reduction. You can identify the hot spots uh, you know, at really quite fine resolution, even finer uh, than this. Uh, and you can, as I said, uh, look at those at national levels and identify what are the annual expected benefits for flood protection of keeping your natural infrastructure in place. And that's really important because otherwise our national accounts just look at how we use up our natural resources. And so we need to put them in the context of what it means to keep them in place. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, did you have a question? Yes. Um, you tried... Can you introduce yourself? Very briefly. Hi, I'm Raul. You know me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a researcher in coastal protection and I, I focus myself on ecological measures as well, specifically seagrass. Um, my question is, you said you were uh, trying this, like what, what it would be to keep the ecosystem. You try as well what uh, other scenarios in which uh, that it, scenarios that include restoration. Yeah. Uh, and so also, so also just questions in one. Uh, you showed the ten-year line. Did you also try fifty, a hundred, and what was the difference between those? Right. Yeah. In in order to uh, I don't have uh, one of the uh, the pictures here. In order to get an annual expected benefit, you actually have to look across the entire storm frequency distribution. So we model one in ten year, one in twenty five, fifty, <coughs> hundred, uh, and two fifty. Uh, in order to then look at the difference between the two curves. So essentially, you get a curve. I showed that one slide back. If you could, Fabrice. Um, uh, the, the, the curves that you get are in the, the sort of middle of, of the right there, and that's across your 1 in 10 year all the way up uh, to, to your 1 in 100 year. Uh, and essentially you have to integrate the area between those curves to be able to get the annual uh, expected benefit. So the short answer to your question is yes. Um, uh, on, the, on the scenarios also, yes. Um, uh, so we look at restoration scenarios. We look at sea level rise scenarios. Uh, we also look uh, at scenarios for uh, changing distribution uh, of uh, storm frequency and intensity uh, under climate change. Okay, the last one there, go ahead. Um, I am Sylvia Vikander from the United WCMC. I just have a question as to the cost and labor intensity of this cost benefit analysis approach because um, I mean, all EVA projects, for example, are encouraged to do a cost-benefit analysis. You s I've been trawling through project documents recently of Jeff-funded EVA projects, and lots of them 
um, haven't done a cost benefit analysis or what they consider cost benefit analysis is a very sort of shoddy literature review of things that they could find on the topic in the country. So, um, how feasible would it be to use, you know, this is a very rigorous approach, um, this approach on a more project base? Yeah. Uh, for me to speak on one slide back again. Varying budgets. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so it is. It is true that uh, you know uh, a, a really rigorous cost-benefit analysis is uh, you know uh, can be a bit expensive. Uh, you know, my my core advice here again is that well, it was made a lot cheaper by the fact that we were willing to use existing tools and a lot of existing data that had already been collected by Swiss Re and McKinsey. Um, uh, so that made our job, our job was still difficult, um, uh, but it made it a lot easier, uh, you know, uh, in doing that. And so that's why I would continue to recommend that as being extremely helpful. Um, we then, because we were using their tools, um, we actually got a lot of pro bono support. Um, uh, they were they were very happy that we were then going to apply those tools uh, and did a lot to uh, help us get to those results. And do you have sort of have you drafted any overarching guidelines on the process of you know that you went through basically to do it? So for other projects, is this one? No, no. It's uh, so so the guidelines. Uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, guidelines for measuring and valuing the coastal defense benefits. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that's a uh, that's a whole series of chapters on. Uh, what the available evidence is. Focus on coastal defense uh, in, in this particular instance. Uh, but I would argue that, uh, well, one, that's very comprehensive in, in those guidelines. Uh, uh, and then two, uh, many uh, of the kinds of uh, principles and advice that we find in there are relevant across many of the other uh, ecosystem services for, for which we're trying to develop adaptation projects. Uh, we'll have time afterwards for, for more questions in, in the panel discussion. I will now give the floor to you, Alan. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I don't have slides, I'm sorry, or perhaps you're, you've had enough PowerPoints already, but that was fascinating. I love that one, uh, Mick. Yeah? You know, because you had houses and you had properties, and you had a very clear you know, relationship between damage, value, in other words, of, of investing in ecosystem based uh, adaptation and and one of the challenges I think from our perspective at IMI is working in the water world well for a start water is quite often a hidden resource we've heard groundwater mentioned already we've heard uh, access to drinking water the challenge of ecosystem flows um, and one of the challenges there is, is understanding what's happening so I'm supposed to answer a specific question here, so I won't go off on a long ramble, but you know, one of the big challenges in, in dealing in, with water and hydrological systems is knowing what's happening and dealing with the complexity in those systems. It's easy to talk about ecosystem-based adaptation, but ecosystems are extremely complex, you know, very, very difficult to, to measure and monitor, and very costly to do that properly, right? So it's easy to say, let's do EBA, and this is where I'm coming to the question, I think, that I'm supposed to answer. Let's uh, converge principles together and let's get EBA on the agenda of governments and, and in policy documents. But you also have to look at the cost factors involved. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, integrated water resource management, as you know, has been around since the Earth Summit, pretty much, in 1992. So, you know, there are 25 years, a quarter of a century of trying to do catchment planning and experience across the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and in Europe. It's still being implemented in Europe. It's still having challenges. You know, I come from the Thames Valley, where implementing uh, catchment management is, is in its infancy. So these kinds of systems, the complexity of these systems, makes the implementation angle the development policy if you like of taking an idea like EBA or IWM into practice very difficult very costly and the word I want to use and my watchword normally because I come from a political science background is the politics of it right because you've had this description here and those principles are great right but no one shares a common set of values so every system that you're dealing with here whether it's an ecosystem or hydrological system is surrounded by a political system and it's surrounded by a competitive value-laden environment where people will be contesting the nature of those values that is politics that's development arguably um, and when that contestation becomes hot and conflict-laden you know that's if you like 
the kind of violent end of development, but development normally involves contestation around whose values matter in any policy document. So any policy process incorporating EBA or trying to take this set of principles into practice, practice has to navigate what is politically feasible in any context and what isn't. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, I would love to be able to do this, yeah? I would love to have a set of uh, IWM principles and measures and indicators that could be applied globally or applied in, a, in a, a range of contexts. But they're very difficult to, they're very context specific. And within those contexts, they're very specific to the set of values that are being uh, put forth by the, the governing environment in that context. So to give you an example, in Uganda, where we're doing work on IWM catchment planning with GIZ, we're trying to understand how do you build this into the local political environment, into the local development environment, and how do you meld together district planning? So I think you mentioned local government is very important. How do you bring district planning together with catchment planning? How do you try and persuade someone in a district which is a part of a, of a wider system, and there are many districts within these, uh, these shared catchments, that they should be aligning their planning and development policy according to the principles of integrated water resource management and catchment planning. It's very difficult, unless they can see the big picture. Right? So unless they can understand how the whole system benefits from their planning and their neighbouring district's planning and all the other districts sharing this, this ecosystem, they all share this, um, this space, they all share this geographical space. So there's a notion of collective action, I think, and the whole challenge of collective action game theory and all the other things come into this um, and I think should be included. So I think in answering can there be a convergence between existing principles and standards, well there has to be a convergence but it also has to go further than just convergence, it has to be you know, the institutionalization through political processes of, of deliberation in any political decision making or development environment. So that's, that's very important and that really comes out in our work in, in, in Uganda in Karamoja because you're talking about people in that shared ecosystem who have a range of interests in the forests and in the water, in the land and in the animals and the, the, the farming systems there. So, you know, managing and building a, a consensus around this complex environment that's subject to huge external pressures. We keep on talking about climate change. Now, one of my bugbears is climate change is happening for sure, but so is demographic growth and so is migration and so is economic uh, shocks and financial shocks. So, you know, let's not privilege or overprivilege adaptation to climate change. What about adaptation to pressure on resources from populations, from market penetration, from the political economy of global trade? You know, these things also have to be included. So I think that's another element that, that really comes out, and that's really my second point, in that natural ecosystems have to be seen in relation to non-natural systems. So the, the human systems, if you like, the trade systems, and particularly migration, which just makes everything horrendously complicated, right? Now, the answer, I suppose, or the question I'll, I'll pose back to you, is should you stop at that point and say, hey, it's too complicated, what are we going to do? Or should you say, you know, <clears throat> like you've done with your, your monitoring and your, your assessment, take it to a very local level and look at particular applications in particular um, localities and see what can be done with a very broad set of principles applied. You know, um, the danger, and I've, I, for a large conservation organization, I once had a consultancy to try and draw together their conservation and their development arms, and that was a political process in itself, but the challenge is balancing what are conservation goals and objectives and what are development goals and object objectives, and that's such an obvious point to make, but really it goes to the heart of how you take those principles and apply them in practice. So my, my kind of la last thought is, you know, water and the water systems that we deal with in IMI, particularly in IWM context, are hugely embedded in, in these wider decision-making political environments, governance environments. The process of deliberation around how to, to move to, to effective monitoring of, of progress in managing catchments, ecosystems and, and the like is, is essential. So I would like to see in this audience here a lot of people interested in the politics of taking these ideas into practice. But that's all I wanted to say. Thanks.
um, it's it's great, and uh, I guess the, the, basically a lot of the difficulties in taking this to the next level is, as you say, the ecosystem is complex. We're all part of the ecosystem, and when we sometimes talk about monitoring, planning, yesterday we had a session about the whole resilience of the system and whether you can actually control or manage it, and the, and then come to the politics side, the politics of talking about things, as Trump and Brexit show that the more complex the message is, sometimes it's not very effective. And that comes to the reality of it is that so because this is such a complex system and you're communicating sometimes with people who just want you to have very simple messages or very simple ideas on how you can plan it, how you can monitor it. So it's a constant this fight that we're all in in how to translate this need for complexity thinking and the reality of we can't control the ecosystem, we can't really monitor, <coughs> plan, or indicate the next two years what exactly it's going to deliver with basically the reality of <coughs> implementing it. So how do you see that kind of two words kind of coming together and what's the most effective way mm. of doing that in your experience? Yeah. Shall I? Well, I mean, the most obvious thing is you have to start with a value judgment, right? You've got to start with where does your policy want to go? So your, your point about, you know, protecting the coast there and protecting people's houses, the value judgment there is that the houses and the people living there are the thing that needs protecting most, right? I mean, I'm not, you know, it may be oversimplifying, but that's a value judgment. That's a very important, and that's enabled a, a, a proper piece of work to look at how to, to do something to protect that. So your value judgment as a starting point. You know, you go back into political philosophy if you're not careful and all these kind of arguments. But if you don't start with a value judgment and a value judgment derived from our understanding of an ecosystem is which parts of that ecosystem are worth preserving because we need them, then you have to ask, who's the we? Is it the poorest in the ecosystem? Is it the middle class? Is it, you know, uh, who is it that's going to benefit? We talk in rather bland and open terms about benefits of ecosystem services, but who is the we that are benefit benefiting from the ecosystem services? So, you know, it is it is a value statement you have to start with. It's a, it's a real understanding of who you're trying to benefit, which is why, you know, the SDG goals are so important. Any of these goals are so important because they help help to set your, if you like, your moral compass or your values set, and then you work back from those, or any policy document for that matter. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalie? Okay, great. Thanks very much, Elise, and your colleagues as well for the opportunity to, to speak today. So uh, I'm wanting to present some new and emerging findings from an ICI-funded project which is called EBA, um, Strengthening the Evidence in Informing Policy, which the International Institute for the Environment and Development is undertaking along with UNEP, WCNC and IUCN, which I'm supporting as a, um, you know, a funded uh, knowledge exchange fellow who's just started back in that position. Um, so part of this project is an ever-evolving, ever-deepening um, analysis of the role of nature-based solutions in general and ecosystem-based adaptation in particular in national adaptation planning, with an initial focus on the 166 nationally determined contributions that have been submitted um, to UNFCCC by ratifying countries of the Paris Agreement. Um, and a number of key, really interesting, and perhaps quite surprising results have emerged from this analysis that have you know, great interest to this community. Um, so across the, so 100, of the 166 NDCs that were submitted, 138 actually had a substantial, substantive um, adaptation component. And of these, we found that 80% identified um, threats to um, biodiversity and ecosystem services, and 75% of them said that action was urgently needed to remedy this. And put in another way, um, protecting nature was in the top five motivators for developing adaptation plans across all the world's countries. Um, in terms of how adapt countries should adapt and the prominence of EBA, well we found that actually only 22 nations explicitly used the term ecosystem-based adaptation <coughs> in their adaptation um, plans, but we found a further 29 actually effectively had a vision for ecosystem-based adaptation in their country. In other words, they acknowledged the interdependencies of human resilience and ecosystem resilience. 
When we looked at what countries are actually planning to do, we found that actually 70 nations had substantial, tangible, ecosystem-based actions, or they committed to them. Admittedly, 75% of those were were, going to, were were planned rather than current, and were dependent on, on external sources of funding. But nonetheless, 70 nations committed to EBA actions, and a further 32 committed to as far as we could tell, um, conservation activity, so more business as usual conservation, which didn't have those key properties of EBA, in other words, in particular, that they were um, you know, putting people at the centre, that they were community-led, participatory um, adaptations that use biodiversity and ecosystem services as part of an overall strategy. Um, now we found, interestingly, that in 17 nations, um, EBA activities were committed to as part of the mitigation component, which is rather surprising. But overall, um, we found that 50% of nations with adaptation plans committed to EBA, and a total of 73% committed to nature-based solutions in general. And we can talk a little bit about the difference um, between those two. Um, but one of the major issues, well, there were several major issues. So, you know, on, on the one hand, this signals, you know, the Paris Agreement signals sort of um, a major breakthrough in our joint battle to combat both the effects of climate change and maintain biosphere integrity. But a lot of those commitments to nature-based solutions rarely translated into meaningful targets. Um, so we found that um, basically of the there were 18, only 18 nations that um, described EBA actions that had targets, and only 11 of them were what we would describe as robust targets. In other words, they were measurable in some way, and this usually involved the conservation and restoration of certain amounts of natural habitat within certain time frames. So um, there were se several issues. So there were some major mismatches between vulnerabilities and actions. So lots of really biodiverse countries that were highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change weren't talking about either ecosystem-based adaptation or conservation in their adaptation plans. So there were mismatches there between vulnerabilities and actions. There was also issues in, with many countries talking about the need to do ecosystem-based adaptation, but then not having any actions that would enable them to achieve that vision. There was, um, there's clearly a real need to scale up EBA actions in montane and grassland and rangeland habitats. But what we found interesting was that even in the coastal environment, which is often the, the poster child for ecosystem-based adaptation, even there, actually, the majority of planned activities within these adaptation plans were more like traditional conservation rather than robust ecosystem-based adaptation. So all this needs addressing as the NDCs are revised um, in the coming uh, year, in 2018. And we really need to work on strengthening those targets and making sure that those ecosystem-based adaptation target targets are based on the latest available natural science, social science, that they are also based on all this learning that, we're, that, that is out there about what works, learning by doing, as Ali talks about, across all this sort of vast network of EBA projects that are currently happening. We need to consolidate that. Um, and these targets um, you know, need to be based on, on, on a strategic set of, uh, of, of guidelines to assess effectiveness. So there are lots of practitioners out there undertaking and trying to evaluate the effectiveness of their EBA projects. And as part of this project, we have um, developed a question-based guidelines for assessing effectiveness. Um, effectiveness and the social dimension, the ecological dimension, the economic dimension, of course, in terms of governance and institutional <coughs> capacity. Now this is going to require not only full engagement of the practitioner community, but also full engagement of the research community and the science community. There's a lot of really good science out there about the effectiveness of various nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based adaptation, but it's really, really scattered. There isn't a place where this is being consolidated in such a way that practitioners can find out the latest information about what makes a particular um, type of intervention effective, what kinds of ways we can work with the environment so that it delivers both in terms of ecological resilience and also social resilience. So we're trying to do that as part of this nature-based solutions initiative. Um, and if I'll leave, leave that there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any clarification question? No, then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if I did. Hi, you mentioned
that um, in the uh, document there is a differentiation between the nature-based solution and an EBE, and you mentioned uh, you might talk about mm -hmm. this differentiation. I would be curious how this uh, document differentiates between the both. I have my opinion, but um, probably it would be nice to. Yeah. So, so nature-based solution is sort of any action that involves a sustainable and equitable um, protection or conservation or restoration of the natural environment in a way that um, helps deal with a range of societal challenges. Whereas ecosystem-based adaptation is that, but specifically targeting um, climate adaptation challenge. So nature-based solution is a very broad term. Within that, we have um, ecosystem-based adaptation. So it's some countries are talking about nature-based solutions and others talking so about the... There, yeah, so to, to clear up on that one, very few countries use the term nature-based solution. 22 use the term ecosystem-based adaptation or similar. Um, in this document, we talked about nature-based solutions to involve a variety of activities such as traditional conservation, such as agroforestry, such as ecosystem-based management and ecosystem-based adaptation and so forth. So we classify, we, we, across all the NPCs, you can kind of quantify all those different types of activities. Um, but generally speaking, ecosystem-based adaptation is the one that's used sort of more consistently, either as a vision or as, a, or as, an, or as an action. Thanks. Okay, we move to the last presentation. to address the question, what are the existing principles, guidelines, and standards related to your specific ecosystem-based approach? Well, um, I'm going to start by saying that Mexico is a vel very vulnerable uh, country to the impacts of climate change. Um, it is located between two oceans with um, uh, more than 11,000 kilometers of littorals. We have a complex topography, more than 4,000 islands, which give uh, the country a large uh, economic exclusive zone, larger than the continental portion, uh, frequent hurricanes, uh, and we have big, deep, huge social and economic inequalities. And uh, Mexico is also a uh, biodiverse country, so there is a strong uh, commitment towards the conservation of the biodiversity. And uh, the EBA approach is included explicitly in policy instruments. Um, uh, in, uh, there is yeah, an EBA component <coughs> in national commitments, uh, such as the special program on climate change. And also there is a, a, an EBA component in the adaptation component of the, a, of the NDC. And, um, well, um, all these policy instruments have, of course, indicators. And uh, the big challenge is how to impact these national indicators with local solutions. Uh, you work with the local communities, you work with the local uh, projects, you have results, you have indicators, but these local indicators do not necessarily uh, have an impact on these national uh, indicators. So. Um, Um, different government institutions uh, are involved in the achievement of these commitments. So it's not just the, the um, um, environmental ministry, the, the environment ministry in, in Mexico. So the idea is to mainstream EVA uh, to all sectors, nationally and subnationally. So uh, frequently, we well, they come to us with a question of what's the difference uh, between adaptation and other practices. What is adaptation? Uh, what's the difference between adaptation and uh, business uh, as usual? And what well, for us the, the important questions are: has, uh, has a for one uh, part has the vulnerability <coughs> decreased? Uh, has the the climate-related impact decreased in with with your solutions, has resilience increased? 
And as for the question of if, if the measures are, are EBA uh, measures, we are uh, the developing um, qualification criteria, and that's why we are very interested in what Kat <coughs> presented um, earlier. And, um, and well, um, among these attributes that uh, should ideally um, be covered by, by this EBA approach are, well, of course, uh, ecosystem conservation, restoration, rehabilitation, but also if uh, are the measures uh, reversible, which is important considering um, uh, climate change uncertainty, are there con uh, contradictions with the AG goals, are there synergies with mitigation, and of course many more have, have the, the, these me measures delineated uh, conservation processes. and. Um, uh, and well, um, I would like to mention that uh, for a while we tried like uh, to to stretch this concept of of EBA, uh, trying to to include other adaptation um, approaches into this uh, um, integral um, model of of ecosystem based adaptation. But then uh, we realized that what we really needed was a systemic approach. Um, uh, a systemic approach or an ecosystem approach, if, if you will, that could include all, uh, EBA or community-based uh, um, adaptation or um, risk uh, reduction-based uh, 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 adaptation or, and even great solutions, technology, um, climate-smart adaptation. And, and what's important for us is that, um, that well, the, the, really the, the acknowledgement that what you do here has an impact there. And, um, and, and don't get me wrong, we are still fans of, of EBA, uh, and we will uh, always uh, work towards uh, the, the dissemination and, and the importance and the benefits of, of EBA. But this conceptual frame has helped us uh, involve other government institutions apart from the environmental ministry and, and avoid maladaptation. And when you consider this, uh, this systemic approach, uh, frequently EBA uh, measures stand as the best solutions and best cost-effective solutions. And well, with this I finish my participation. Uh, one clarification question. <laughs> no? Okay. So if you go to the panel, we'll have a, uh, we have about, well, 10 minutes. <laughs> so now I really open the discussion for uh, uh, everyone here. So in the last two days, we've heard a lot of talks on climate EVA and how it's the best cost-effective solution uh, or one of the best cost-effective solutions. Um, my question is, I mean, what Alan also pointed out, so um, EBA, I mean, so which, I mean, it has to be implemented through, it, through existing institutions. And uh, currently, there are, it's very difficult to navigate through the various existing institutions that you might pay to help promote implementation of your EBA. So yesterday in my talk, I gave an example of when we tried to uh, you know, implement this in Nepal. It was very difficult to even find an institution which we could link up to. Was it uh, Ministry of Forestry? Was it Ministry of Ar Agriculture, etc.? And then when we did decide to on this Department of Soil Conservation Watershed uh, Management, and they uh, promoted the project or they bought in the project, the other departments and ministries felt uh, that they were coming into their territory because all these institutions are also then very territorial. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. You know? So how to yeah, link it up to the existing institutional context? And that's a very difficult question. Who wants to take this one? Mike, go ahead. Well, I, I would first say, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. It is, it is a, a complex problem. We, we've uh, encountered some of the same difficulties as well. I mean, I would say in the first instance, getting ecosystem or nature-based uh, projects um, uh, accepted and evaluated by ministries of finance and development 
that's huge. I mean, that you really, uh, uh, if, if we're not doing that, we're always going to be, uh, you know, essentially a marginalized environment department uh, and this sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I would say in the first instance, it's been very important to be able to reach those ministries uh, and risk reduction uh, uh, ministries with risk reduction responsibilities. Um, but then you're right, you can't forget, because uh, we actually made that mistake once, and I can tell you in a long, you know, uh, in, in a sidebar, um, uh, made the mistake of, uh, you know, forgetting to bring the environment agencies along, assuming that, oh, they were always our friends, uh, you know, uh, and, and everything. Uh, we learned that lesson once, uh, the hard way, uh, won't forget it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, can, can you all be brief also, please, so that we can pack a few um, with My name is Harry James, I'm a master's student here at UNU EHS, and I want to ask a question about the framework. Um, there could be, could be said that there are lots of community-led initiatives and movements, like, for example, the transition movement, that are doing EBA in everything but name. And I want to know, to what extent does that framework, what's the wiggle room for capturing community-led initiatives that are adapting to climate change with ecosystem-based methods or is that just designed to be attached to projects because we spoke a lot yesterday about how EBA currently exists in a project discourse but there are lots of people perhaps practicing it outside of that. Um, I think my answer is brief. I would want them to use it <laughs> um, and I think that we tried to design it in a way that was easy to um, to understand at different levels and at different, with different backgrounds and approaches. I'm not familiar with the, the transition, transition movement, transition movement in particular. Um, or any community that is. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, I would like to complement the, the, the answer because I think, well, I don't know much about the transition movement, but I would say that the, one of the key um, uh, results of uh, an EBA uh, initiative, it doesn't matter if it's project or whatever, is that it's, uh, um, it's based on uh, integrated vulnerability assessment, including socio-ecological systems. And what comes out of that? You have priority areas, so that is important because that would say, well, it's better <coughs> or you need to work um, or invest in these areas better than in those areas because these areas are more vulnerable according to ecological process, but also because there you have more vulnerable people. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the, the, the sites or the areas or the ecosystems which are uh, more vulnerable together with the uh, communities that are more vulnerable. Yep, Mark. My name is Mar Mora. I'm also a student from the United Nations University. My question goes to uh, Margarita Caso, but it could also be answered by others if you have any um, idea. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that in Mexico, you're not only uh, looking at EBA solutions, but also ECODRR and others. And we've seen recently that one of the main threats or very catastrophic threats are earthquakes. So I was wondering <laughs> if there any research done on the potential of ecosystems for reducing the impact of earthquakes? So, for any in the panel? Or if there's a trade off actually in implementing some of these projects in having this uh, Well, the, the short answer is no. Um, but since we, we as, as you know, had a, um, a strong <coughs> earthquake. Uh, very recently, the, uh, this has detonated a lot of research around around the, the subject. But I I haven't heard uh, a, a, an ecosystem um, approach to the problem. So I I think that's interesting. But I don't know if there are any studies. Yeah. So um, my the director of my program, the ecosystem management program, was with other colleagues in Nepal running a workshop actually for ecosystem-based approaches when that earthquake happened. And our colleagues in the IUCN office in Nepal with partners actually have had quite a lot of success in mainstreaming bioengineering and other approaches um, 
for road infrastructure into national and other policies in Nepal. So um, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but in Nepal, landslides and other um, results of earthquakes can really affect that infrastructure in particular. So that's an example that I would give. One very last question. Carl and Lilian will take, we'll take both of them and we'll answer them uh, together. Yeah, my question is for uh, Mike Beck, but maybe it can be reflected on my others as well. Um, I'm curious about the, val the, the risks of, of valuation, um, especially with ecosystem services and, and implemented measures. Um, I guess the, the map you created is the absolute value. Um, so does that overlay, are you basically just like the hotspots of the wealthiest coastal communities? Um, so just, I mean, is there, have you made a relative as well? And then also just generally for the, for the panel, uh, maybe you reflect on the, the dangers of showing things that may be more valuable but shouldn't in, in you know, if you value them a certain way, they may come out as more valuable, but shouldn't be prioritized uh, for other reasons. Uh, I, uh, my name is Liliana Nabaez. I am a master's student from the United Nations University. My question is related to something that Ali mentioned, so maybe we can all get it together. Is this thing about the problem with that many of the organizations that do represent, for example, a project <coughs> So you have this area, this country, and in the last of 10 years, you have a, a project of two years, and every time it's like, it you know, becomes another project, and obviously, they have to send the reports to the donors, and everything is going to change. Like uh, Angela was saying about, first it was mitigation, then it was community-based adaptation, and then you have ecosystem-based adaptation. So my question is, how to tackle this problem of the need to have projects? In, and how we can ensure that the community is actually getting what they need. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's maybe it's a topic or, or idealistic, but it's something that he was mentioning. Like, you <coughs> say to the donor something, but the community is having another process. And maybe with the framework, the community will know what they are doing, right? But what about the people that is actually getting mm -hmm. the money from the projects? So what I propose is that we go from uh, Mike and we come up here. You can answer one or two of the questions <coughs> very, very briefly, or have a final statement, and then we'll call it today. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I agree wholeheartedly uh, uh, with your concerns. Uh, we uh, have analyzed uh, uh, those values in absolute. We uh, examine them per capita. Obviously, you get very different answers when you do that. Uh, we've looked at people uh, that, that are affected, where, where they're most important to people, where they're most important to people below poverty. Um, uh, we've included a whole range. Uh, so once you develop the flood maps and you have the differences, you can examine a variety of different kinds of values, metrics, indicators uh, underneath those. Uh, those are all very important. I will, however, tell you um, uh, that if you don't show uh, the dollar values, that will be the very first question um, uh, you get uh, from the vote. If I show just people are people of poverty, they go, okay, but you can't get to the economics, um, uh, and that would be a major limitation. So that's why we all, if I've got one slide, I'm going to show you the dollar. <laughs> Well, I, I would like to say that um, we need, uh, and it was discussed yesterday, but I, I would like to emphasize that we need to go beyond projects. And that is uh, very important because the, the whole EBA is started through projects, but we really need to guarantee that policies are, I would say, nature-based in general for sustainable development. So it, because uh, climate change, we have to live with it. It's already there, so we need to introduce all this thinking in development planning and in, in policy. Well, I would like to mention that uh, one of the, the lessons learned from implementing adaptation projects is that you have involved, you have to involve the communities, you have to involve the, the people in, in every stage of the project from the vulnerability assessment to the design of the adaptation measures, implementation, and then uh, um, participate a participatory evaluation of the project, but you have to work with the people in every stage. Huh? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, going back to your point, values are socially constructed after all, even a dollar value is socially <laughs> constructed. You know, the question is, okay, the values may vary, but how do you trade the values? 
right? So what system do you enable? Do you allow the market to do that? Do you do, you do it in a purposeful manner? Is government involved? Is it through other? That's a critical question. It's not just the values themselves, but how they're traded. Related to and following on from all the comments, I think it's really important that we don't, in our minds, even as we evaluate um, ecosystem-based projects, separate human resilience from ecological resilience or separate economic resilience from ecological or social resilience. We have to think about the socio-ecological and the socio-economic um, context, and we have to evaluate and move forward from that basis. You know, nature is fundamental to everything that we value. Um, the science says so, and now the you know the high as I presented in, in my talk, you know the high level pledges say so as well. But despite all that, I would you know following on from what you said, um, um, climate change is happening. People are having to adapt right now, and adaptation is all about the people. So in terms of trying to get EBA better represented and more robustly represented in policies such as the NDCs, we really do need to start with the communities, and we do need to to. Um, make sure that policy development is participatory and community-led as much as we need to make sure that EBA is participatory and community-led. So when the policies come back down to the people, the people recognise them because they have been deeply involved in their design in the first place. That's only by getting that sort of buy-in will EBA be, become robust more broadly and will become meaningful and enduring over the long term. Thank you. And Kat, you have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to answer your question that was posed towards Ali, I'll answer it in a way that he would answer it, because I've heard him say it many times. Communities don't say, on Monday, let's do forest landscape restoration, and on Tuesday, let's do EBA. Wednesday through Thursday, we can do integrated uh, water resources management. You know, the interventions are often very similar. Uh, the rationale at higher levels or our level might be different, um, but the, the common goal is often the same. And about projects, the, whether it's a two-year project or a 15-year project, still needs a sustainability <coughs> strategy. You need to build capacity and, and strengthen the governance of the, the people that are involved in it, exactly like what Natalie said, um, involve them so that they recognize it. Thank you very much.